would you ever use a traditional, a more commercially available flea and tick preventative on your personal pets? I would try everything and anything possible to avoid using traditional flea or tick medications for my pets. And there are, they're all neurotoxins. I don't think that neurotoxins and pesticides belong inside or on top of my animals. Have I used them in the past? Yes. Did I use them a lot more before I knew better? Yes. Now I know better. I avoid them like the plague. My response is the exact same. And again, we'll go into more details of what we do, what we look for um, in just a moment. Now, DCM, this is a hot topic as well, and grain-free food. So here's my question for you. Do you believe personally that DCM is linked to grain-free food? Well, the FDA has found no link between DCM and grain-free diets. And part of the problem is that a high quality, high meat diet, like raw diets or freeze-dried diets that do not contain grains are lumped into the same category as grain-free kibble that is filled with peas and potatoes and lentils and things that our pets are not meant to be eating. So we need to make some distinction, but there is no link. There is no proven link between grain-free diets and DCM. We could get into that a little more later. Yes, we will. Yeah. Whew, told you this is going to be a hot one. Um, now let's talk about heartworm, heartworm preventative. In a high level, high level view, how do you protect your dogs uh, from heartworm? What's kind of your personal protocol? My dogs do not receive chemical toxins monthly or any time during the year for heartworm prevention. We use natural ways to prevent mosquitoes from biting our pets. And we use natural ways to keep our pets from being exposed to heartworms. Um, the AVMA, AHA, uh, American Heartworm Association, they have all put out a renewed statement that every dog and every cat should be on monthly heartworm preventative all year round no matter their exposure level or where they live in the country. What a myth. And I just, I love, I love how, um, how many synergies we have, just like the same wavelength there. Uh, now about spay and neuter, which I know is a very hot topic, especially in my community that I do a lot of rescue work and foster work. So this one we will talk about towards the end of the video in more context, but do you think that all dogs should be spayed or neutered? Absolutely not. I have a year and a half old puppy next to me who is an intact male and will remain an intact male for the rest of his life. Love it. So there you have it. There's kind of our hot, Dr. Judy's hot takes on these hot topics. For those of you that follow me, you, you know my thoughts on these things, which are basically and essentially the same, but we're gonna go into greater detail. And I wanna give an important disclaimer on this, especially because quite a few of this stream, quite a bit of this stream will be hosted on my platforms is this content very clearly is not meant to act as a way to prescribe, diagnose, professionally recommend, even though we have a professional veterinarian with us, which is such an honor. Um, this is Dr. Judy and I sharing what we believe, what we do with our personal dogs for you to take to your veterinarian who might have differing views or beliefs so that they can kind of maybe potentially reassess their practices. And after this live, we'll have a bunch of resources. I'm going to put Dr. Judy's blogs as well, all linked in the description so that you have this like booklet of, of resources and information that you can take to your vet to, to, to help make decisions. So let's go back to the first one we talked about because it's one of the more popular ones and that is flea and tick. So you, you mentioned that you do not use toxins on your dog. So I think that's something that's highly misunderstood is that these popular, traditional, commercially available flea and tick products are actually made with um, parasitic toxins. I mean, these are toxins that we use um, to, ki like, to actually neurologically kill uh, the flea tick larva. Um, and that's actually like we're, we're putting that on or inside of our dogs. So it's actually really concerning when you look at it at that level. 
It is. Um, I, I, I kind of look at it and say, well, if I would not e eat this chemical myself or put this chemical on my body, and if I am opening a package that has directions that say wear gloves when applying, and this is going to stay on my pet's skin and coat for the next 30 days, do I want my two-year-old grandchild hugging that dog, petting that dog, sleeping with that dog? If I'm using a chemical flea or tick collar, do I want my other dogs who might wrestle together getting that chemical in their mouth, do, which they are when they're grooming themselves anyway, do I want them chewing on that collar? Do I want my granddaughter potentially chewing on that collar, handling that collar? So, and then we get, so topically, we've got a lot of issues. Um, we know that the European waterways have been tested and all of their rivers and streams are contaminated with fipronil, which is one of the topical parasiticides that is used in on so many dogs. And they're actually blaming the contamination of the waterways from people using these products on their dogs and then the dogs swimming or bathing and it's going down the waterways uh, through the wastewater. So this is a huge problem. Some of these chemicals that we use are highly, highly dangerous to aquatic life. So we are destroying our planet because we're afraid we might see a flea or a tick on our animal. People think that these chemicals repel fleas and ticks. What you need to understand, if you have a dog with flea allergy and he will chew himself raw with one flea bite, giving him a pill that is going to kill the flea after it bites the dog does not help the situation one bit. Your dog still has to get bitten in order for the insect, the flea, to ingest that chemical. And the same for the tick products, the tick attaches, the tick takes a blood meal, then the tick dies and falls off. So for everybody who says, but I don't wanna take a chance on my dog getting Lyme disease or, or leukiosis or anaplasma, the tick still has to bite your dog. And when we first learned about Lyme disease, oh gosh, 50, 25 years ago, um, I had clients, we started testing every single dog that came in along with their heartburn test. They got a Lyme test every year. And I had so many clients who had never found a tick on their dog were using chemical topical preventative every single month religiously and their dogs would still come up Lyme positive. And they're like, how can that happen? because we didn't prevent the tick from biting your dog. All we did was put neurotoxins on your dog. And the, one of the biggest problems with a lot of these chemicals is they are only supposed to affect the nervous system of fleas and ticks. Unfortunately, there are a lot of dogs who are susceptible to these neurotoxins and will develop seizures, tremors, death, liver failure, kidney failure, internal hemorrhage, dry eye, the, the, the the side effects from these things are so overwhelming. And like I said, I have used, I, I've never really had a, I, once in my life, I had a tick problem with dogs. Um, otherwise, I've had a couple of flea issues, but it's so easy to get rid of them now. We have so many good natural products available. Why would we head the toxin route? Yeah. And I, I think your point about the fact that the fleas and ticks have to bite for those toxin riddled uh, preventatives to actually work is so underspoken about. I know you speak about it a lot, but in terms of mainstream, like your dog still has to be bit. And, and that's actually how I learned about the more natural holistic ways, which I'll talk about in a moment, what I do and you can share yours uh, to prevent flea and ticks is because I had my dog on one of those monthly uh, pills and or actually he was on the topical and he still, he was getting these ear infections and I couldn't figure it out. I took, I went to a different vet and I didn't know at the time this vet was holistic, more integrative holistic. And he was like, your dog is having a flea allergy, like severe flea allergy. He only had a couple fleas on him, but it was like a severe, I was like, but he's on monthly preventative. And he's like, he's still getting bit. And it was a bunch of, uh, we had a bunch of feral cats in our neighborhood that would hang out in the yard and bring it over. So he was like, we need to talk about prevention. And I was like, okay, well, what do I do? Go get, you know, a pesticide, you know, pesticide to spray all over my yard, which is basically what these medications are made of. And he's like, absolutely not. And that's when he started educating me on the potential neuro neurological impact of putting this not only 
on my dogs or inside my dogs, but in my environment, my yard. And that's when I learned about nematodes. That's when I learned about dimitaceous earth. That's when I learned about pet safe um, essential oils brands. I just grabbed this like kin and kind, which is just like an organic. I, I know you're, I believe you're a big fan of them as well. Mm -hmm. um, organic kind of flea and tick preventative you can spray in your dogs. And that entire conversation and that experience for me was, was life-changing because I was able to get him off of this flea and tick medication, which by the way, is really expensive and it's not cheap. So it's like, we're, we're paying a lot of money and we have to remember to give it every month or every three months. Um, and, and I just didn't feel good about it. So that, that was kind of my experience with that. So what are some things you do around your home and your, your property? Cause I know you're a bit more rural. <laughs> to help so we have prevention. we have 23 acres yeah. um we have a farm most of it is cleared and then we have uh wooded paths around the outside of our uh, property so for our d dogs and cats um we have a, a large clouder of cats so they spend a lot of time outside they a lot of them live mostly in the barn um, but our dogs are in a fenced backyard that does not have a lot of trees and shrubs and mulch and undergrowth because that's where the ticks in particular like to hang out. Fleas and ticks do not like bright, sunny, dry areas. So my backyard is a hot, bright, sunny, dry area. So there's not going to be fleas and ticks there. Now my kitty cats who are catching mice and roaming around the property and having a lot more fun, yes, they are the ones who like to bring the fleas to the dogs. Yeah. That can be an issue. So what we do is we, I, what I, what I am loving lately, my absolute favorite product is the Project Suds Flea and Tick Shampoo Bar. And I, I, I never thought I would like a soap bar. Let me tell you, a soap bar it beats a shampoo hands down. But um, so if I see fleas on any of the dogs, they instantly get a bath. We don't have any carpet in our house, which is hugely helpful. And if I think that we're getting a flea problem, everything in the house gets washed. All the dog bedding, all the people bedding, anywhere where the dogs sleep, everything gets vacuumed under the sofa cushions and the crevices, anywhere where fleas might hang out or the flea larvae or the flea eggs, because you're only seeing 5% of the life cycle of the flea on the dog. The other 95% is in your house, in your yard, in your car somewhere else. Um, so if I had a problem, if I had a yard that had a lot of trouble, I would choose either nematodes or diatomaceous earth or spraying cedar oil on the yard. Yes. All of which, my sister lives in Massachusetts, huge tick problem, huge, huge tick problem. Um, she has a mown yard, but it's, she's totally surrounded by a wooded area, tons of deer, tons of wildlife. And so she has a huge tick problem, which Massachusetts does in general. Uh, so she has somebody come spray cedar oil on her yard every single month. And it has, it has to be repeated. It's not, it's not a one and done thing. So throughout the season, she has her yard sprayed. She keeps it mown short. She had a beautiful wildflower field right in front of her yard. She had to mow down the wildflower field because that was becoming a huge problem. Um, and I think that instead of taking down the whole field, she probably could have done about a 10 foot wide uh, perimeter that, from her fence that probably would have helped. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. And again, it doesn't prevent. So there's no, there's no reason for me to put a chemical on my cats and dogs every single month waiting for the flea infestation to happen. So instead I wait for the fleas to show up and then I'm like, well, how, how quickly can I get rid of them? So I go through my whole you know, we're going to clean everything. We're going to wash everybody. The cat, I don't, I don't really want to wash 13 cats. So kitty cats get sprayed with essential oils. Um, or I, I actually have something called um, buck mountain parasite dust, which is neem and diatomaceous earth. Um, we started using it on our farm animals for lice. And it's amazing. Like a tablespoon of that will cover an entire donkey. So, and, and it does a great job. And uh, so we, a little tiny bit of that. So the farm cats are not really thrilled about being manhandled and sprayed, but a little tiny bit of that in the palm of my hand. And I just pet them down their back and kind of rub it in and that'll take care of the problem for them. So there's so many simple ways that we can do this. Um, and the essential oils are going to repel a lot better than a chemical that you put on that does not repel. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, back to my experience of having my dogs on the monthly preventative, still having a flea issue. Uh, now that we do the more natural preventatives, like you said, I mean, I swear by Dimitatious Earth, like where we live right now, we have black widow infestation issues. We're at the bottom. We're in California. And I mean, it's, it's scary. We have um, fleas and ticks are really bad here as well. And we have a lot of trees and shrubbery. And I just dust that stuff on the perimeter. And I'm in a, I'm in a Facebook group in my community, my neighborhood. And it's every day, look at these spiders, look at these fleas, look at these ticks, these beetles, all these, these creatures. And I'm not against all bugs, but I never have problems with that. And I have used these more natural protocols, which again, what we're talking about everyone, because I see a lot of people in the chat, Dimitatious Earth, which is um, pet safe. And for those of you asking what these specific brands are, if you check the bio of, or the description down below, I'll have Dr. Judy, she has an online store. So it's like everything you need is there. I have my shop page. So I'll make sure everything is linked for you. So you can just go, you can take, you can spend this time to consume and try to absorb kind of what we're talking about. And then you can go look at the specific products. But for me, the Dimitatious Earth, everything you said, the Dimitatious Earth, the more natural preventatives, I love soap bars, um, has worked for me in upstate New York, Texas, Oregon, and now California on between anywhere from two to four dogs at a time that we go outdoors, we go to the beach, we go to the mountains. And so um, I think that there are options out there. And I think, you know, we all just have to make the decision that's best for our dog. Uh, I think the other thing, you know, going back to what the more traditional commercial flea and tick products can do neurologically with seizures and even chronic skin issues that I've seen, you can even do your own research. You, there's Facebook groups with thousands of pet parents in there that you can go research that they had their dogs on these products and had horrific, horrific outcomes. And I'm not trying to fear monger, right? I'm just trying to educate and inform. And you can go read these people's personal testimonials that have nothing to gain by sharing that. So I encourage you, if you're on the fence about it, to, to do that. Because I think that for me, at least, that was really eye-opening. Yeah, traditional veterinarians are, um, they mean well, they're in a hurry, they're overworked, they're overwhelmed. When the drug sales rep comes in and says, hey, we've got this wonderful new product, it's just a chewable that your client has to give their dog four times a year, every three months. So simple. Side effects? Yes, very few, very few. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And the veterinarians, they... They have to rely on the fact that they are being given truthful information and they don't have time to look at every single product that is brought into their office by a sales rep and go to the FDA and look up the adverse event reports or go on the EMA in Europe and look at the adverse event reports of which for the, the oral flea and tick products, there are hundreds of thousands of reports. Um, we had a conversation, a group of us had a conversation uh, with the FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, about these products and the number of deaths, the number of animals damaged with seizure disorders, you know, basically maimed for life, having to be on anti-seizure medications because they had a dose or two of these oral products. And the FDA's answer was, and they, they gave us an hour of their time. I will give them credit for that. This is a couple of years ago. But at the end of the conversation, and we brought them the reports with the hundreds of thousands of reports, and they said it's not enough. Not enough. I don't know how many animals have to die before we get a change, but I do not want one of my animals to be one of those. And unfortunately, the dog that we just adopted, the shelter gave him a three-month oral flea and tick pesticide. And I, every day, I just... I pray that today is not the day that we're going to see a side effect because the side effects don't necessarily occur the day the tablet is given or the week the chew is given. You can get these side effects occurring weeks to months later. It's, it's very unpredictable and horrendous if it happens to your dog. Yeah, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. So um I think one, the one last thing that I think is kind of interesting to consider when it comes to flea and tick and just general health are the potential, and I want to get your thoughts on this, the potential benefits 
of free feeding, not feeding, feeding a less processed, more fresh food diet and how that can help the immune system. Um, how things like a little bit of fresh garlic, a little bit, I know people are like garlic um, <laughs> in their diet uh, can help naturally repel, right? We're, we're this, this is what we call holistic medicine. Like we're thinking about the whole picture, not just preventative and not, which is very important in terms of uh, topicals or products and not just treating, but also how do we start from within? Um, can you tell me some of your thoughts on that? Absolutely truth. The healthier your pet is, the less chance of them being infested with fleas or ticks or any other parasite. Garlic, coconut oil, um, we have so many natural things. Neem as an herb can be fed. So many natural things that we can do. So our dogs are all raw fed. And the last time the cats brought a bunch of fleas up to the house and played with the dogs, um, only one dog ended up with fleas. And that was the puppy whose immune system is probably the weakest because he's got some other issues. Um, and so I gave him a bath and that was that. But then I said, you know, I want to be a little more proactive here. And I started all the dogs on raw garlic. When you use garlic, it is safe. I have done many posts on the safety of garlic and I've had many people come back at me and say, you can't be that, it's dangerous, it's toxic. And then they, you know, give me the, they post all the links to all the wrong sites that say it's toxic. It's not toxic. Um, the original study that was done, oh, probably 50 years ago on the toxicity of garlic, they used a garlic extract that would be the same as feeding like 40 bulbs, not cloves, bulbs of garlic to your dog. Nobody's going to do that. So what I did with my dogs is I took one fairly good size. I have four, at the time I had three, three small dogs. Um, and so I took one fairly good size clove of garlic. And before each meal, I would mince it up, uh, fresh clove, mince it up. You have to use fresh. You don't want to use that stuff that comes in the jar. It's lost all of its effectiveness. So get fresh garlic, mince it up real fine, mix it in with their meal. They actually love it. And from a Chinese medicine standpoint, it has so many benefits, so many benefits. Um, but no more fleas. So one bath and garlic for a few weeks, no problem. So it, that's the type of thing, now that I have all these cats, <laughs> when flea yeah. season hits, we're in the South. So when flea season hits next in the spring, I will start feeding my dogs garlic earlier so that we're warding that off along with, um, I also have the, the one who seems to be more of a flea attractant. He wears a... Um, a, tag, a collar tag that is also insect repellent. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, go at this. Yeah, I, I agree. And so I think that's a good, uh, are there any topics on flea intake that I didn't cover that you think is really pressing? Because I think we covered a lot of really interesting tidbits that I think are really helpful. People are commenting that they love this. So yeah. So for the people who are really concerned that, oh my gosh, my dog's going to get Lyme disease. My dog's, you know, yeah. if, they, if it, if a tick bites him, blah, blah, blah. And remember that he's being bitten even with chemicals. Um, we have a really um, good blog on ticks and tick bites and tick disease. Um, the chances of your dog actually developing mm. a disease from a tick bite are actually low because it's only a small percentage of ticks that carry, and you can have your ticks tested. We have a link to where you can have a tick tested to see if it was carrying anything. Um, so the, the percentage of ticks carrying disease is low. The, the chances of it being on your dog long enough to uh, transmit the disease is low. So if if that's your big concern, like, oh my gosh, I don't ever, because, and, and by the way, tick-borne diseases are treatable. You just have to figure out that your dog is sick. Um, most of them, even if they, and there's a lot of false positives on the tests. So there are secondary tests that you can do to make sure that it's a true positive. If your dog's symptomatic and positive, probably needs to be treated. But we get so many dogs who come up with a positive test. They're absolutely fine. They, they're running around acting normal. And so one, they get over-treated and two, people get overly freaked out, uh, with a positive test. So I would, say, go read that blog on ticks if that's your big concern and why you're still stuck on using chemicals. Yes. And Gwen, I know you're watching. If you want to send that to me, I'll link that in the the, the show notes, I think, as people say. Uh, make sure I'll get all that stuff there so you guys don't have to go search for it. Um, yeah. You know, like I said, I couldn't agree more. I think 
as as a pet parent, it, it's very difficult because we are faced with um, differing opinions and recommendations by our conventional veterinarian. And as Dr. Judy beautifully said, they're not doing it to be malicious. They're not pushing or not pushing. They're not promoting or recommending these traditional products because with malintent, intent, they're just doing what they can. And especially nowadays, like it's a very, very challenging environment for, for veterinarians. They're yeah. overworked, they're stressed. And it, like you said, there's, <laughs> there's these, these reps, these sales reps that come in and they give you these articles and these research and these studies that look official. And it's kind of easier to do that. And, and it's kind of become the mainstream norm. And so Dr. Judy is just, you know, such an inspiration to me. <laughs> Because you're you, you're going against the grain, which is kind of a fun segue to DCM in just a moment. But like swimming going, upstream, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like it takes a lot of courage and bravery. So I, I do hope everybody following or watching here goes and follows you because uh, you have inspired me for years, and um, it's just incredible to to bring you here. So let's jump over to DCM, and then then because a hot one is heartworm and spay and neuter. So those of you waiting for that, and you're asking when are you gonna, those are coming up next, but before that, let's talk about DCM. Also, by the way, if you're following, make sure you click that follow or watching, click that follow and subscribe for more vet chats like this. Um, so DCM, uh, you answered before uh, that you do not believe that DCM is necessarily linked to um, uh, grain free, free foods, but let's first define and talk about what DCM is, which is my understanding is it's a degeneration of, of heart muscle. Can you um, elaborate on that? Yeah. So, and it's funny because we've been talking about this for about five years now. And three yeah. years ago, I said, why are we still talking about this? And here we are yeah. five years in and we're still, still talking, talking about, about this. It. It, it, yep. I, see, the, see the gray hair? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> this all happened since the DCM debacle. Uh, yeah. So DCM stands for dilated cardiomyopathy. It is a genetically inherited disease in certain breeds of dogs, Irish Wolfhounds, Great Danes, um, St. Bernards, Cocker Spaniels, which is the only small breed that we really see it in. So they're kind of an outlier, but a lot of the large breeds, boxers are, are just huge on this. Um, it's a genetic problem. So somewhere between three and five years of age, they suddenly will have uh, decreased exercise intolerance. So a great friend, owner of All Provide uh, Pet Food, he has had a Great Dane and he took his dogs to exercise in the park every single morning. And his Dane was just the coolest dog. And the dog was swimming, which he did a lot, and all of a sudden started to go down. And Dennis was freaking out. He said, oh my gosh, he had to jump in the lake and go get Alden out of the water and swim him back and basically be the, the lifeguard on duty. And so he had no idea why that had occurred. And his dog didn't even have a murmur. And when he went in and they did a workup on the dog, they discovered that his heart was kind of like the Grinch. It grew 10, size, 10 times its normal size that day, um, except that it had been happening slowly and he had no clue. Um, so sometimes the first symptoms that you'll see are uh, maybe increased respiratory rate, maybe some weight loss, um, decreased exercise tolerance, fainting spells. Um, so it can, it can kind of sneak up on you. And like I said, his didn't even have a heart murmur. Most of them will, but his didn't. Um, so we know when we see it in these genetically linked breeds, okay, great. We kind of expected that. He's a boxer. He's a Great Dane. So we kind of go, okay, well, that's a genetic problem. Well, when this all this whole thing started, a cardiologist from Tufts, I believe she's a cardiologist, um, said, oh, seems like we're seeing more dilated cardiomyopathy cases. And a cardiologist from UC Davis, so we got both sides of the country, said, oh, how about that? I think we're seeing more DCM cases. And for whatever reason, now, and why, this would be the first question you would ask people, like, because cardiologists never ask, what does your dog eat? All of a sudden, that was the only question. And they put out this big article. By the way, both of these doctors are funded by, all their research is funded by large pet food companies. So, hmm, is there a little bit of 
influence or bias going on. Um, and then they somehow got the FDA to post a list of about 20 pet food companies. And they only had 500, a little over 500 cases of dilated cardiomyopathy. And they did not even take out the cases that were breeds that were genetically prone to have this. So if we took those out, which was like 75% of them, we're left with, oh, look, we have 100 dogs and there were cats thrown in there too with dilated cardiomyopathy. And what are they eating? And so I don't even know if we if we re-looked at the list of foods after we took out all the ones that were genetically predisposed. I mean, we're not left with a lot. And when you consider that there's 160 million dogs and cats in this country and we have 500 cases, if every pet eating grain-free food was going to develop dilated cardiomyopathy, we should have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of animals with dilated cardiomyopathy. And FDA let this stand and they threw these companies under the bus, which these company, one of the biggest companies, I guess, can I mention them? was origin yeah. Yeah. origin lost 30% of their sales. They make origin and Akana it's champion pet foods. They lost 30% of their sales because when these doctors came out with this statement, they said, we are blaming grain-free foods because a lot of the dogs in this and cats in the study were eating grain-free foods. They didn't take the raw feeders out and separate them from the dry kibble feeders. So raw foods were thrown under the bus too. And what happened is all these people who were feeding these beautiful, raw, high meat, species-appropriate diets all of a sudden we're going back into their local pet store and saying, no, I need to buy Purina. I need to buy Royal Canin. I need to buy Hills. It has to have corn, wheat, and soy in it. Absolutely the wrong things to be feeding to our pets. We have no link. So in December of 22, so here we are four and a half years later, in December of 22, on the original post that FDA made about the link between grain-free foods, they put just this little new sentence in very quietly, didn't announce it, no press release, no nothing. This little tiny, not. by the way, oh, we haven't been able to make any link at all between grain-free diets and dilated cardiomyopathy, case closed. No apologies to the companies they threw under the bus. But the interesting thing, and call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, but one of the big pet food companies that was behind this push for grain-free DCM linked problems just happened to buy out champion yep. pet foods. Yep. And now all of a sudden it's not a problem. Huh? Yeah. It's, I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's all there is to it. So again, you know, so I was, you know, I've, I've worked in the pet industry, pet food industry for years. Um, and I was, deep into it when this all happened. And it was just this blow up of these independently owned, truly nutrition focused brands that were impacted. And that honestly was, was heartbreaking to see, you know, these, these, these people in the industry that are actually doing things the right way. Um, they're actually formulating in a way that's optimal for dogs, species appropriate. And as you mentioned, the revenue losses that they they incurred, they're still, I mean, companies went out of business. They're still oh, yeah. not, and, and that's, and that hurts us as a pet parent community, as a veterinarian community, more than I think we even realize because it makes it harder for people, individuals to create truly, truly nutrient dense, truly, truly appropriate species, appropriate diets um, to enter the market. This like barrier to entry it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monopoly in my opinion. And oh, this is. was just this little uh, scam. I mean, it really, I think somebody said in the comments, like I feel scammed and that's, I mean, yeah. I, I feel it. I feel it. Well, the feel problem it. is the, it, it's just, it's just like our government. You've got all these influencers, you've got um, the packs and we have that in the pet food industry. There are pet food industry groups that represent big pet food and they have huge influence over FDA. They have huge influence over AFCO. And I mean, I've been to the AFCO meetings. I've seen that influence occur. And 
it is very unfortunate because they have so much influence with the veterinary community because they these big pet food companies spend so much money advertising within the, the veterinary community, giving free food to veterinary students, giving discounted food to veterinary employees. They really want everyone in the pet industry, particularly the veterinary pet industry, to have their pets on these diets. And that's a lot of influence. And if you are a student and that's all you, if this is all you have coming in, guess what's going out over here? It's, oh, that's formulated by veterinarians. Well, there are many, many small pet food companies, independent pet food companies, raw pet food companies who have food formulated by veterinarians. And, you know, they're not just going out on a limb and throwing stuff in a, well, some are throwing stuff in a bowl. Yes, uh, well. I, yeah, I should take that back. There are, there are some um, pet food companies that are not knowledgeable enough to have completely balanced, nutritious meals in the bowl. But saying, that, unfortunately, I get reports every single day from clients, particularly from cardiologists, saying, my dog has to have grains in its diet. I did a, a, a consultation for a veterinarian. She's an ophthalmologist. And so she worked in a specialty group and her office was next door to the cardiologist office. This was maybe a year and a half ago. And she said, I need you to design a diet for my dog. I can't remember what the dog's problem was. And she said, the only thing I will say is I will not feed grain free. It has to have grains in the diet because the cardiologist next door says so. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I gave her my whole rant and breakdown of everything. She went, oh, yeah. and she did agree to feed a diet without grains. And I said, look, if you, if you just really can't wrap your head around this, then this is the grain I would add. This is the amount I would add. And then you can feel better about it. But the, our, our pets and AFCO knows this and FDA knows this and the cardiologists should know it. Dogs have zero requirement for carbohydrates in their diet. Zero. What is a grain? Carbohydrate. Carbohydrate. Amen. Not necessary. Uh, yes. Amen. And that, that, I mean, that's a whole nother, that's, we're going to do another live and talk about <laughs> carbohydrates. Um, you know, I think it would be great. I think it'd be fun to, to, to break down some uh, ingredient panels because I think that we as pet parent communities have been misled to believe that just as you said, the, that our dogs need these higher carbohydrate, starchy filled diets um, for not even just for the uh, DCM debacle, but for just general health. Because as I'm sure you've heard multiple times, our dogs have evolved to mm. digest carbohydrates better. So mm. they're more omnivore. So we won't get into that now, but yeah. You should so talk I think, to Dr. Ian Billinghurst about that. He has we, a lot I to have, say Yes, that. he's very, <laughs> very passionate about all of that. Um, but I think that, you know, to kind of summarize what you're saying is that net, net, and, and for those of you who aren't familiar, because I forget that, you know, we're in the pet food industry in terms of just being involved and researched, but I think a lot of, you know, pet parents might not remember or maybe just weren't um, involved in that. So just to kind of back up a little bit, there, um, there were these claims, because I'm seeing some questions come in, there were these claims that... Uh, these grain-free uh, foods, these boutique foods, these independently owned nutrient-dense foods, like an origin back in the day, um, were causing uh, uh, DCM, which is a heart disease, essentially, in a degeneration um, of the heart muscle. So what Dr. Judy is saying is that according to the FDA, as of a few months ago, they officially, but quietly, <laughs> announced or, or stated that um, there really is no link between a grain-free food uh, and DCM. I mean, and then and, and I think I just saw your, I think, oh man, I was trying to find your blog so I could pull from stats, some stats from it. But basically you were saying that the amount of dogs that were diagnosed with DCM were, um, a, I, think, I think if I remember 60 it's or 70% of them were because of genetic purposes, yeah. not because of what they were fed, which I think yeah. is interesting. So tell yeah. me then, let's just, so we can have it in kind of one easy sentence or simple sentence. If it, I mean, obviously, obviously, I know you're the same. We are advocates of a 
complete and balanced, species appropriate, real, raw, fresh food diet in like this perfect world. A lot of people watching this are not quite there yet. They want to get there. So they're more in the gently cooked and or kibble range. So when they're looking at these, tell me, Dr. Judy, what are your thoughts on foods specifically kind of in the more kibble baked, um, maybe even freeze dried category that are uh, grain free, maybe ones that have some legumes. I know legumes is like a, a, a controversial topic for whatever reason, or even right. novel proteins. I have no problem with novel proteins um, if we have some evidence behind them. Because right now we're talking about making cricket protein dog food yeah. and some really weird things that have not been tested. By the way, my cats eat the chickens dried milk worms all the time. So apparently, and they eat grasshoppers. So I guess it's a protein There's source. A protein. But, <laughs> um, and they're cats. Uh, I don't, my dogs might. I don't know. I haven't tried. I don't, I don't really want to. Um, <laughs> So our dogs need meat in their diet. They don't need carbohydrates. And the problem with traditional extruded kibble is it's going to be 40 to 60% carbohydrates. And any kibble that is extruded, it is a high heat process. So by the time those raw ingredients get, get from point A to point B, they have probably been cooked at extremely high heat four to five times. There's no nutrient value left at that point. Um, and that's why synthetic vitamins and minerals get added back in. And that, and then they also get sprayed with fat to make it taste like something other than a dry brown rock. So we've got problems with oxidation and rancidity with those fats. We've got problems with the body saying, oh my gosh, there's all these synthetic things that are being thrown at me. I don't know what they are. So I'm going to you know, have an allergic reaction. I'm going to try to spit it out. The skin's going to break out. We get interdigital cysts. We get ear infections. That's the body just saying, oh my gosh, make it go away. Um, so fresh whole food diets, if you have to feed kibble because you, I mean, a lot of people live in like food vacuums, food deserts and have a hard time finding fresh stuff. Um, so whatever you can add fresh to the bowl, if you can replace 25 to 30% of the calories with things like fresh eggs, I know they're ridiculously expensive right now. That's why we have chickens, uh, fresh eggs, broccoli, pumpkin, uh, blueberries, you know, fresh fruits, not grapes and raisins, uh, fresh fruits and veggies that are steamed, uh, anything like that. If you have a, you know, an extra little bit of chicken breast left over, not the skin, not the grease, not, not, the, fat, not the fat from the cooked steak, but um, things that would be healthy for us generally are healthy for them. You will increase your pet's longevity by about 30% by filling their bowl 30% with good stuff. Um, there are tons of companies out now that have gently cooked foods. Even some of the raw companies are grinding their foods at a small enough grind that they can be cooked. My new rescue dog does not like the texture of raw food. He was a dry kibble dog before. He is not getting anywhere near that raw food. So we are cooking his food and then it's more like a crumble. He thinks it's the most amazing thing he's ever had in his life. His skin is getting better. His ears are getting better. His weight is getting better. All those things that were caused by eating kibble that have caused problems for him. Um, it's it's going to be a process. It's not something that happens overnight, but I'm we've had him a week and a half and I'm already seeing improvement in all those things for him. So um, whatever you can do, and if you can get baked or air dried or freeze dried kibble texture food that is so much better than food that has gone through the extrusion process because it's not cooked at really high heats. And the other thing that you really want to avoid when you're looking in the pet food aisle is rendered products. So that's going to be thing and, and unnamed products. So if it says meat, and bone meal or meat byproducts. Lord knows what animal that came from. It could be 20 different ones, uh, including euthanized dogs and cats. And no, I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm just spilling the truth. Um, when you see like uh, meat tallow or um, uh, rendered fats, that kind of thing. And then when you see that long chemical list that you're like, oh, gosh, I got four ingredients in and now I can't pronounce anything anymore. That's a, that's a, Oh my gosh, I better look somewhere else. And there are tons of freeze dried foods where you just add water, poof, easy to do, good to go. I will use that when I'm traveling with my pets. I can stay in any hotel anywhere with my bag of freeze dried food, a little hot water out of the tap, boom, done. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are several brands that you love and that you share on your page. So I know people can look for you there. 
link down below in the description of my YouTube and in my profile. I have my dog food list. I pretty much guarantee you we have a lot of synergies. Every, everything you <laughs> oh, say, you know, it's, and it, and it makes sense because I, I learned from you. So, yeah. And I think the only other thing I'd add with, you know, on, on the kibble side of it, not that this chat is really about that is a really, um, big issue in my opinion with feeding an ultra processed hot extruded kibble for the entire life is that a, the way that they're able to make it shelf stable is by removing most of the moisture. So what happens is you're feeding a dog this uh, food that is void of moisture and dogs are designed to get their um, water that they need from their food, a lot of it, maybe not all of it. And so that's why I love just like Dr. Judy, Judy said, the lesser processed options because they're going to retain more moisture. And the most moisture is going to be in the, the the gently cooked or the raw foods. So, okay, so this was fantastic. I think that this was a good overview of, of, of DCM kind of squashing some of the concerns with that. And again, always work with your vet. Um, I do recommend to at least consider finding an integrative or holistic veterinarian. You can go to AH vma.org find a vet section if you can't find one near you dr judy do you take clients i am not in practice no. anymore um right. i do a few online consultations <laughs> but we have i'm just i'm so You're backed up. up yeah um yeah, so. <laughs> but we have if somebody if somebody emails us for a consultation and i don't have an opening we have about six or seven other okay. holistic veterinarians on our list that we can refer to Perfect. Perfect. So there's, there's a bunch of options for you there. Okay. Now, before we get in, I know we're getting a little long, but this is so good. And a lot of you are really loving this. So before we get into spay and neuter, let's talk about heartworms. So in the beginning of this, I asked you, Dr. Judy, do you protect your dogs? Do you give them anything to protect from heartworm? And your response was no monthly no, chemicals, no monthly chemicals. I quit so tell me your about, thoughts on this. I quit about six years ago. Um, we lived in New Jersey at the time. And of course I was trained. I, actually, when I graduated school, we were still on the everyday pill, the DEC, the diethylcarbamazine um, that we had to give every day. And it was during my first year in practice that they came out with HeartGuard, which was the first one for monthly ivermectin. And so that was amazing. We are like, oh man, once a month, this is great. And then when I got more holistic another 10, 15 years later, um, and I started doing research and looked at the original studies presented to the FDA on uh, how effective the monthly products were, because by that time we had a few of them out, um, started looking at how effective they were, how far out they had tested them. Most of them, I think all of them at the time, um, were actually effective for more like six to seven weeks like 99% effective at six to seven weeks, but they said, oh, well, you know, first, if it drops to 95% at eight weeks, well, well, we can't have that. Um, and people are too stupid to remember to give something every six weeks. So we're going to make it monthly. And we'll, you know, and as veterinarians, we were trained to tell them, well, don't you pay your mortgage once a month or your car payment once a month, just put your little sticker on that. And that'll remind you to do it. At that point, we didn't have cell phones to remind us of everything. So, you know, put it on your monthly calendar with your little heart sticker that came with it. Um, and they made it monthly because they figured that's what people could remember. Um, and they came up with the all year round because you really don't want to start heartworm preventative without a negative test. If you have a dog who is positive for heartworms and you give them a preventative pill, it will kill the circulating baby heartworms and they can go into anaphylactic shock. So you don't ever want to start if you're not giving preventative or if you stop for the winter, you don't want to start again without testing first, make sure they're negative. Um, well, then the more I got into uh, alternative and integrative medicine, I did more research on heartworms and found out that lo and behold, it takes two weeks from the time the mosquito um, ingests the baby worm larvae from an infected dog. It has to spend two weeks in the salivary glands of the mosquito. And if the temperature drops below 50, at this, at that point, they were saying, if it drops below 57 degrees at any, any point in that two week cycle, the cycle stops and the, the heartworm larvae are not infected. And so I started looking at where I lived and I said, well, holy cow, it drops below 57 degrees at night 
most of the year except for about three months. I said, well, that stupid to be giving a chemical to my dogs 12 months out of the year or my patients 12 months out of the year when they really need it probably four months. So then we did this modified schedule where we would just bring every single dog into the practice in May, test them, and then we'd have them start as soon as we had a two-week period of the temperature being warm enough. Sometimes that wasn't until the middle of July. So I came up with this modified protocol. But then I also discovered when I went back and looked at the FDA studies, which have now been taken down because they passed their 20-year mark, um, when they looked at milbamycin, which is an interceptor, that drug was originally looked at as something called safe heart. And there was a dose for under 50 pounds and a dose for over 50 pounds. And those doses were one fifth of the dose that is now in those pills. And it was 99.9% effective at one fifth the dose. The only reason they multiplied by five and made the dose higher was because at that point, HeartGuard had added Parantel and it became HeartGuard Plus so that they could label for roundworm and hookworm prevention, intestinal parasites. And so they played around with milbamycin and said, oh, well, if we multiply the dose by five, we can label for roundworms, hookworms, and whipworms. Nobody else has whipworm prevention on their label. So our dogs got five times the necessary dose to prevent heartworms so that we could have a label claim for whipworms. Now, there are some people who have, if you get whipworms, those worms, the eggs are impossible to kill in the soil. They'll live for year and year, year in, year out, freezing, heating, doesn't matter. So that is a problem for some people. So what I started doing with my, my clients is giving them the option, we can give you a lower dose and you can give it every six weeks and you can only do it during this part of the year, which meant that my patients were now getting two to four pills a year instead of 12, and they were getting it at a lower dose. And so I did that for quite a few years. And then I finally went, this is dumb. Like my dogs just don't have exposure. <laughs> and I just yep. stopped. Um, and then when we moved to North Carolina, yes, it's warmer. Yes, there are more mosquitoes, but I described my property in my backyard. I don't have mosquitoes because there's no standing water and there's no trees up close. Mosquitoes kind of like the same damp, dark tree area. Um, and then in the evening, as soon as the mosquitoes come, and we have uh, ceiling fans on our outdoor porch. So in the evening, if I get bitten by a mosquito, we all go inside. Or I get out my dog's essential oil flea and tick spray, and we all spray with it. And then none of us get bitten by mosquitoes. So that's how I deal with it now. Um, and then I test my dogs for heartworms every year. Yeah. I think um, what I love about what you described is really the journey that I went through I, personally with my dogs is having them on the monthly. And then again, this more holistic integrative vet saying, you know, I was actually in Texas too, when he said this, which I know is, it's more prevalent there, but he was like, you know, in this area, I'm just not seeing a prevalence of it. So if you want to cut back and do it less in that quantity throughout the year, it's going to be in my recommendation better. And so I started doing that. And now we're to the point where um, I'm not, I don't have it on, I don't use it. I don't give it to them. And I'm not going to lie. Like there's still this part of me because it was ingrained for so long. It's only been a few years that I like kind of stopped um, giving them the monthly preventatives. And it's still, it's in my head. It's like in the back of my head, like, Oh, like what if something happens? But the prevalence in our area, where in my area now is so low. In fact, I was looking up, uh, I was trying to look up statistics before this, and I think it was 1% um, of dogs actually in the U.S. actually test, or maybe if it's in less than 1% now, but around 1% of dogs actually test positive uh, for heartworms. So it's like not super common, not super prevalent. It's not, and there are definitely certain areas of the country. So the Heartworm Society, uh, the Veterinary Heartworm Society, posts, and I have links to this in a couple of my blogs, but they post the heartworm prevalence map for the United States every year. So you can look and see how many cases were reported because if a clinic uh, has a positive dog that they want to treat, they have to report it. You can't just keep the drug on hand. You have to call the company, give them the case stats, and then order the drug for, the, for that particular dog. So they know exactly how many dogs are being reported and potentially treated. Now, 
I would say the majority of heartworm cases are probably in dogs that never see a veterinarian. So we had a stray dog show up in our yard here in North Carolina, some sort of a coon hound. He was adorable. And so we kept him for the weekend and said, and he was loaded with fleas, loaded with ticks. I mean, oh my God. So, you know, he wasn't on a good diet because he was not repelling any parasites. And so on Monday, he went to the veterinarian. He's heartworm positive. He's got fleas. He's got ticks. He's got every intestinal parasite under the sun. So this poor guy, his immune system was completely trashed. And so I said, all right, well, here, here we go on this journey. And then as soon as Gwen brought him back from the vet, she had him on her porch. She came out her door in time to see the dog jump over the railing and take off across the field. And that's the last time we saw him. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah. So he didn't want to live with us because we were going to make him healthy, I guess. Yeah. I he was like, oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not, living <laughs> wait, with they, the... they took me to the vet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for so, that. So poor guy. But yeah, I mean, heartworm is, is definitely a problem, but I think it, that a lot of the problem is in these dogs that don't receive any sort of care. They're not getting good nutrition. They're, they're not, they're living outside all the time. You know, this, this guy's probably somebody's hunting dog who took off. And so, yes, we see a lot of that. When I was in New Jersey, the cases that I saw in my practices, which were only, oh gosh, less than half a dozen a year, most of them were either dogs that came up from the South, because after Hurricane Katrina, that became a big thing to bring dogs from the South up North. Um, so either they were dogs that came from the South or older dogs lived outside by the Delaware River in the swampy marshlands. And again, didn't receive veterinary care until they looked like they were going to die. And it's like, oh, look, these heartworms. Um, so for the really good pet parent, and are there outliers? Yes. I had a client in upstate New York who, whose dog became heartworm positive in upstate New York. I mean, that's hard to get heartworms up there, but her dog did. So it's an individual decision based on um, the exposure that your particular dogs have. Yes. And I think that I was just getting ready. I was just thinking about what I wanted to say next, uh, which is I want to make this clear because I'm seeing some comments come in that neither Dr. Judy or I are going to sit here and say, stop giving your monthly preventative today. You're killing your dog. You're making a bad decision. What we're saying is here's the information. Um, the chemical that is in these um, is essentially an insecticide. Um, it's a toxin. So we as pet parents need to make the best decision for our dogs. And really like my goal with my content and Dr. Judy, it seems like you're the exact same is not necessarily telling you as the pet parent, like what to go do instead, informing you and giving you the resources so that you can make your own informed decisions and to take this information to your veterinarian or maybe even better going to a website like ahvma.org um, they have a find a vet section that will have more integrative holistic vets uh, around you because I think that um, each, in my opinion, each dog is different and it mm -hmm. depends on where you live. I think there's like, like you said, there's a map that shows the more prevalent areas. And I think there's only like 11, 10 or 11 states or so that are really high risk, generally speaking. Um, but then you can work with your vet to come up with a more, uh, conservative plan, if you will, where maybe they're not having to get it as often, you're working more on prevention, the dog's overall health, et cetera, I think is where we're really coming from. The other one that, um, because it took me a while to get to where I'm at. So my holistic vet said, hey, let's at least, because I had come from um, using, I can't remember the name of the product, but it had uh, the hook, I think the hook worm, worm, all that other stuff in it. So he's like, at least just use one that only has the single ingredient. Dr. Judy, you'll know better than me, but I think it was ivermectin or oh, there was another one. I meant to look uh, there's it up. Novomycin, but um, so right. Interceptor um, is plain uh, Novomycin. And now okay. they have Interceptor Plus, I believe, which has Prozaquantel for tapeworms. If you don't have a flea problem, you don't have a tapeworm problem. So yeah. why would you need well, that? that. Yeah. Um, and then there's Sentinel, which is the milbomycin plus a lufeneron, which prevents flea eggs from hatching. And now they have, I think it's called Sentinel Spectra or something like that, which also has the flea 
or the uh, tapeworm treatment. Well, mm -hmm. if it has something to prevent fleas and I don't have fleas, then I don't have tapeworms. So I don't need to give a tapeworm dewormer every month. I mean, it just, it, it's all about labeling. Um, and so you have to look at what environment does your dog live in? D do you have a tiny dog that lives in a high rise in New York city? <laughs> or do you have a hunting dog in the swamps in Mississippi? Totally different, totally different. So you have to decide what is your dog's risk? Have that conversation with your veterinarian. Unfortunately, too many veterinarians are just repeating the same dogma of every pet, every month, all year round. And it, there is no one size fits all. And if they are spouting a one size fits all, then they are not paying enough attention to the individual needs of your individual pet. And that's the conversation that you need to have. This is my dog's lifestyle. This is how much time my dog spends outside. This is you know, other dogs that we see, this is the environment we live in. These are the trips that we take, um, you know, where I get a, a lot of questions, people who maybe they live in New Hampshire. And so their heartworm season is very small, but then they go for the winter in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's how many like, pills well, do I need to give? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, I think that, I think that's a good summary on that. Were there any other topics on heartworm that we didn't cover that no. Think is really I've got, I've got are, so many blogs on heartworms that really go do a deep dive into transmission and how the, the chemicals actually work um, because they don't prevent heartworms. What they do is they kill different stages of the larvae they, uh, right. because the heartworm migration from the time the mosquito bites to the time you actually have an adult heartworm is six to nine months. So if your dog is bitten this summer, you'll find the positive test if they develop heartworms next year um and there's a great youtube video i don't think i have it linked in my blog i might uh where they actually have um a dog blood sample with a um, heartworm first stage larvae from the mosquito that is injected into it and it's a time-lapse photography where you watch the white blood cells and the immune system attack this thing and literally shred it to bits without any chemicals, a good immune system, if your dog gets bitten by an infected mosquito, a good immune system is going to say, whoa, foreign invader, and is going to attack. And it's really cool when you actually see that in motion. Yeah, that's really cool. I'll have to look that up. You'll have to send it, it was a really later, cool video. I forget be... who found it, but yeah, yeah really cool. Um, and before, actually be, before we jump into spay and neuter, which I know is a very hot one, um, somebody did ask, and I think this is a good place because I don't think we, other than, so the question was, are there any holistic ways to try to prevent uh, heartworm? I know that I have my dogs on black walnut. I don't know if, if you've ever used that, but um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's, it's more from my, my, my mental like health with like, okay, what can I do? But um, are there any other things other than what we've talked about in terms of the environment. Yeah, I mean, community. there are herbal products that that portent to be um, heartworm preventatives. Um, I don't, none of them have really good scientific studies where they've taken a bunch of dogs and put them on these products and then infected them with heartworms and see, or, you know, injected them with the immature larvae and see whether they develop heartworms. I don't know of any of those companies that have done an actual challenge study. So I, I, I have to remain on the, I cannot tell you. And I, yeah. there are certainly no guarantees. The problem with black walnut has been, and hawthorn have both been used for a long time as um, paras, parasite prevention, mm -hmm. however we want to call it. Um, the problem with black walnut is it is very hard on the liver. So for my clients who wanted to use black walnut, we did specific periods of time. Yep. It wasn't something that was given every day. And then we would have to go back and detox the liver. <laughs> so yeah. um, when you're using herbal products, just be aware that herbal products can be just as toxic as a chemical product if they're used incorrectly or in the wrong dosages. So make sure that the company you're buying from has done their their homework on it that is a reputable company um you know look for side effects ask for side effects you know whatever um just be aware that you could kill your dog with black walnut if you were using too much for too long a period and not using an approved
for sure. I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a good call out for, you know, I think, I feel like we're kind of in this era of what supplement or what thing can I give my dog or put on my dog to fix whatever ailment I'm struggling with or to prevent whatever I'm fearful of. And what you just said, it, it, a lot of people, I think one of my number one questions I get is, what are your favorite supplements for this or that? And I'm actually in essential oils and, and, and I'm actually not the biggest fan of them just as a catch-all, right? Like I like them when they're needed, but for me, I look at a supplement or an essential oil as supplemental to a base, healthy diet, lifestyle environment, et cetera, which I'm sure you're, you're aligned on. So I think that it, it, I think it's a really good call out that I get a lot of uh, pet parents that will start following. And I'll mention a few things that I like or that I have used or they'll see other people in the community and then they go buy all the things and start giving all the things. And I think it's important to, I guess the best way to say it is to treat or care for the dog that's in front of you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Always what works for my that. dog for, for arthritis, skin disease, whatever, may not be what is the best thing for your dog. So again, you always have to look at it from an individual perspective. We did a really cool thing in our warehouse with our Facebook supporters a couple of weeks ago where we had someone muscle testing um, different products. So people sent in a picture of their pet and questions about different supplements or what supplements would I recommend for XYZ problem that they had. And we went through the warehouse and I picked products. And then the person doing the muscle testing had the picture of the dog and the picture of the product and would do the muscle testing and say, this is great. Or nope, that one's not going to help. Uh, so it was really fun to do. So anybody who's into muscle testing, some veterinarians, holistic veterinarians use muscle testing to decide which products are the best for animals. You can do it with dousing. You can do it with muscle testing. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, and that sounds like we're getting a little more woo-woo, but it's very cool stuff. Um, so instead of just buying everything that's out there, maybe look at ways to determine what might be best for your pet. Well said. Very well said. So let's jump into spay and neuter, uh, which is really relevant for me. I have my uh, Marlo next to me. Well, we think she's anywhere from 10 to 12 months old. I don't really know. We fostered her. Um, she's like my 60th foster dog and uh, I failed and I adopted her. So um, she's not spayed. And um, so I'll talk about kind of what my thoughts are on that. I'm excited to hear yours. So my question is, which we asked earlier, do you think all dogs should be spayed and or, or, or neutered? No, it's again, no one size fits all. Um, I understand. I'm, I'm impressed that you have a foster dog and got to adopt a foster dog without having to have her spayed because most rescues insist on spay or neuter before releasing yeah. the dog. So, so kudos to them for not, for not being that group that said one size fits all. Um, I get why they have to do it. So nothing against rescues. I used to work with our local shelter that's a mile down the road from my practice. And um, we did a lot of pediatric spay and neuter. I hated doing it, but I knew why they were doing it because we had a huge issue in the community, yeah. um, you know, with backyard breeding and inappropriate breeding and accidental breeding and just huge issues. So, so I get it, but we just did a spay neuter focus week on our um, channels last week and uh, ton, we have, so now we have tons of information, tons of blogs, but we have so many studies that show the dangers of taking away gonadal hormones, so ovaries and testes. We have, hey you, Hello. we have tons <laughs> of research showing the benefits of leaving those intact. Um, so when we do particularly early spay neuter, we're taking out those hormones before these animals reach maturity. This has been shown in cats as well as dogs that if you spay or neuter before their long bones, so the front leg and hind leg bones have finished growing, the growth plates at the ends of the bones will stay open too long. They don't close when they're supposed to, to stop the growth. And so by taking away the hormones, those growth plates allow the bones to grow longer. We end up with more elbow dysplasia and more hip dysplasia. The bigger the dog, the worse the problem is. And it's because those leg bones keep pushing up and basically push themselves out of the sockets. And um, so then we started looking, we also looked at 
what happens when we spay or neuter after a couple of heats? Well, we ended up with not having that problem, but, and I saw it in my practice with a lot of people who said, okay, I'll wait till they're like three, four years old, make sure I'm not going to breed if I have a, a, a show dog, whatever. Um, and then literally within months of the spay or the neuter, they would start to develop arthritis and their thyroid gland would trap dump. And so they'd end up with other endocrine problems. And we have good evidence that obesity is related to removing uh, the hormones that come from the ovaries and the testicles. So then we have more pancreatitis, more diabetes. And the endocrine system is all the glands in the body. And you can't take one gland away without affecting all the others. So we see so much more Cushing's disease than we used to see. Now there's a lot of reasons for Cushing's disease, which include glyphosate, GMOs, vaccines, chemicals, blah, blah, blah. But it's also related to taking away hormones. And so then the adrenal glands have to take over because the adrenal glands make both male and female sex hormones. So we, we end up with all these other problems by taking those hormones away. We see more cancer in both male and female dogs that are spayed and neutered, particularly the larger breeds. This is not the same conversation for cats. So for cat people, go to our page and read the cat stuff. Um, but I know Rachel's a dog person. So uh, for my males, because there's no way that my males are going to go willy-nilly breed females, my males are now intact. Now, this is the first male that I have kept intact because I didn't know all this 14 years ago when I <laughs> got my last mail. Yeah. So this is all new information that's coming out. So there are so many reasons to leave them intact. Now for the females, there's this big discussion about pyometra and which is infection of the uterus, which is life-threatening and um, mammary cancer. <clears throat> so we looked at a lot of studies out of Sweden, Norway, Denmark, countries where they don't spay and neuter their dogs and looked at the incidence of mammary cancers, looked at the incidence of pyometras, and there actually were breed differences. So there's actually some genetic predisposition in certain breeds, which was really interesting to see. And they don't have exactly the same breeds there that we do here. Um, but there are just so many good reasons. Now, you could still sterilize your dog you can do a vasectomy. Our Marlo is having a vasectomy on Valentine's Day. I thought that was a very appropriate day to do it. So we'll have videos and more information on that on Valentine's Day. Um, so you can get a vasectomy if you want your male sterilized, but you want to leave those hormones intact. And if your veterinarian tells you your dog is more likely to get prostate cancer if he's left intact, that's wrong. It's the exact opposite. He's more likely to get prostate cancer if he's neutered. Mm -hmm. Um, testicular cancers are 99.9% .9 benign. And so if you get a testicular cancer and he gets a big blown up testicle, then you can neuter at that point. Um, and we go into all the differences and what they're more prone to if left intact versus, um, spayed or neutered. So for your female, you've got four different options. You can leave them intact. You can do a tubal ligation. Uh, same as what we do in women. So you leave all the organs there. They just can't get pregnant. Uh, you can do an ovary sparing spay where you remove the uterus, but leave the ovaries. So they still have that hormonal input. So there's no way they're going to get a pyometra, but you still have that small risk of mammary cancer on the other end. But in dogs, only 50% of mammary cancers are malignant. And if you catch the lump early and get it off, you're going to be in good shape. Um, even for those who are left intact with pyometra, pyometra is very treatable. It has like a 97.5% survival rate if you diagnose it and get them into surgery. So, okay. Um, and then you can, so the ovary steering spay, you're taking out the uterus. But we found really good studies showing that by removing the uterus, it changes brain function. We think that the uterus is this lump that just lays there waiting for babies to come, but it actually produces its own set of hormones and has an effect on other organs in the body. Um, and what's my other one? Um, you can just remove the ovaries and leave the uterus. So with a laparoscopic spay, you can just remove the ovaries. To me, that one makes no sense um, because we're taking away the hormonal input. That would be 
Yeah, I think, um, I think for me coming from being as you are heavily involved in the rescue world, as you mentioned, there, are, you know, I also understand the need for it because um, my thoughts and views align with yours. I think if we really step back and look at the primary and main reason to do a spay or neuter is really for overpopulation control within cats and dogs, not for any medical necessity. I think that's kind of eye-opening. It kind of just became this protocol that we all just kind of followed blindly, which I did. I mean, my Labrador, gosh, he's 13 now, but I don't know. He was under a year when we got him neutered because that's just what they six, said to do. Six months has been the line forever. Yeah. And so that's kind of what we, what we thought. And now everything you've said, what we're learning is that this early spay and neuter can can cause or impact like joint issues, like you said, hypothyroidism, um, cancer, frequent, frequent UTIs. I was reading about the incontinence, that, that incontinence, like that's you know cancer. Um, and it's not to say, oh my gosh, you're going to spay or neuter your dog, and then they're going to get sick. And I know that I know that there's a lot of people watching that it's already happened, and like. And, th and that, okay, then we just move on and we do whatever we can to, to give that dog as healthy of a life as possible. This we're sharing is more of a, hey, here's kind of the full picture so that, again, you can make an informed decision and, and talk to your vet. With um, with Marlo, my my Marlo, um, she's, so to answer, to, to respond to your, your point about the rescue, letting the adopter, yes, they but I still have to spay her eventually. So I, I signed a contract. Um, they were just more flexible with, with me um, and giving me the length of time that I want because I volunteered right. with them for so long, but they, they had to talk about it and I, I do need to spay her. So what I'm doing is kind of what you're talking about. I want to wait until she's had her first heat. And honestly, her first heat was really weird. I don't even, I don't know if it was real, like a full heat. I don't know. Um, and so I want to wait until at least her, I don't know, as long as I can to like two, three years old until they yeah. start tapping on my door. Um, but I wanted to ask you of those four options, well, of the two options, I guess the middle ones, like what do you, what would you recommend if you were in my situation? I'm a huge fan of ovary sparing spay. If, if you can, I mean, you could do a tubal ligation, it, totally up to you. Um, I don't think the uterus, removal of the uterus doesn't have as big an impact as removal of the ovaries, ovaries. So ovary sparing spay or tubal ligation. Um, the great thing about ovary sparing spay is you never have to worry about a pio. So that takes one of the risks off the table. Mm -hmm. um, veterinarians are not taught in school how to do these procedures. It yeah. is, um, <laughs> so the vasectomy on our Marlowe, it will be our veterinarian's first time doing one. And She's great. I, I love her. She's young. She's energetic and she is innovative, but not integrative. She's a traditional veterinarian, but we went to her with this proposal and said, we will allow him to be your dog to learn on with the hope that she says, oh, well, this wasn't so bad. And she will now be a resource where other people can go get a vasectomy on their dog if they want a different option. I love that. I know I, I am worried about fine. I haven't found anyone yet. Um, fun fact, where I'm moving closer to my mom in a few months. We're moving to be near her. And when she, when she got her dog, the three out of the four vet clinics in the area um, refused to even see us because we raw feed. <laughs> and, oh and, and yeah, I mean, actual refuse, like, cause they asked on the phone and, and you know, it's crazy because they all asked, so they must have the, it must be coming, becoming more um, uh, popular in the area to raw feed, but they were, they were like, oh, what, what do you feed your dog? Like, as I was asking about making an appointment, oh, I, I raw feed. Oh, unfortunately, we don't allow raw fed dogs in our clinic at all. I'm like, that's special. So I'm that's, sure. That's, a, that's yeah. another conversation for another day, but that's a good soapbox right there. Yeah, no, that'll definitely be another that, day. That, oh, man. Yeah. Um, so oh, what was my question? It was about, um, oh, what are your thoughts on the idea that, okay, well, I'm going to, it's usually more on the neuter side, but spay or neuter my dog to help with their behavioral issues. Uh, the studies that we found showed that aggression was actually worse after spay yeah. or neuter. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I went to a behavior lecture probably 20 years ago um, with one of the leading behaviorists. And um, she was talking about female dogs and puppies who have fear aggression. And she said, a lot of them have that because in the uterine horn, they were next to a male puppy and it, uh, it caused changes in their hormones. But she said, what you really want to do is leave those females intact longer so they build confidence. You want their hormones to build. You want those female hormones to build to kind of give them that, that nurturing that the female hormones give rather than, you know, she basically had too much male hormone in her system. Um, Interesting. But even on the studies with males, um, they showed that if you neutered a male, his aggression would become worse. Yeah, so I've seen I would not neuter or spay thinking that it's going to change my dog's personality for the better. I would not neuter thinking that it's going to stop my dog from marking because I've got a lot of spayed females that mark. <laughs> yes. So it didn't go change that either. Peeing in the house. <laughs> nope. That's a training issue. Yep. Yeah. These are all behavioral training issues. So, okay, good. I'm glad I wasn't sure your thoughts on that, but I figured, I, I figured it would, it would align. Um, but I think to kind of summarize what we've said here is generally speaking, as long as any, so anybody watching this, I strongly believe is a responsible pet parent. And so I think what we're saying is if you're a responsible pet parent that can keep your dog from having unwanted litters um, or creating them, then there's really no medical need or really even medical benefit in most situations, I don't wanna generalize, uh, for your dog. And generally speaking, through research, it's likely healthier to not spay or neuter. But if you have to, like I'm in a situation where I'm legally I have to, um, eventually to wait as long as possible and to go with the less invasive options if possible. Is that sound like a good summary? Yeah. I mean, when we look at Scandinavian countries where they leave the dogs intact, they don't have the huge overpopulation problems that we do. It's called responsible pet ownership. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the good studies can come out of as well. Um, so, you know, there's, and we have links to all that. So if people need something to take to their veterinarian, we've got the links. You can print out the studies and go, hey, you know, we might want to have a conversation about maybe we should look at this a little differently. Um, yeah. And that's, I think that's, I think that pet parents are going to be the driving force behind changing the veterinary field. I think if more, like, you know, the veterinarians who are saying, oh, you can't raw feed your dog. Well, that's because a lot of people were coming in with raw fed dogs and they believe the hype that's on ABMA website, a AHA website, CDC website, FDA website, which is all hype. And we have lots of studies to show that raw feeding, not a problem. Kibble yeah. feeding, you might die of salmonella, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yes. On that note, anybody watching live or on replay, leave a comment below if Dr. Judy and I should come back on and talk about raw food, if we should talk more about conventional vets and dog food. Um, another topic that has come up has been, um, I don't even want to say it because it won't, but we'll just say the, the annual or yeah, annual shots that dogs are given. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't, I have to be careful what I say because uh, social media. So if you guys my, are interested my soap, in those My soapbox is just going to get taller and taller. I, I know. <laughs> so if those are topics you guys would like to hear us talk about together, leave comments um, down below, even if you're watching on replay and then we'll consider that. But Dr. Judy, this has been fantastic. Um, like I said, I have been a big fan of, of you and the ability to learn from you and your team. Really, I know your, your daughter is involved and you have um, this awesome family business has really been an honor. Um, I have your book, um, your products, you have your own products, plus you have products that you, you recommend to help pet parents like take care of their dogs. And so all your information will be linked down below, but I just want to genuinely thank you, not just for how you've impacted my life, but for stepping out um, and going against the grain, um, <laughs> swimming upstream, as you said, because I know that's not easy. And I know technically you could just go and retire and just relax. But no, you're here. <laughs> you're here fighting for, for our pets and for us. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity to reach more people and educate people. I, I just, I, I'm in it for the animals. I want them to have better lives. Absolutely. So make sure you guys um, click that subscribe button. You follow along both Dr. Judy and I's channels. 
um, to help your dog learn how to live longer, live happier, and to train them more easily. So with that, I'm going to end the stream. So thank you guys all for being here. Thank you for the questions. Keep, oh, also, there's been a lot of questions in the chats on both Instagram, Facebook, you everywhere. We didn't get to those. So what I want you to do is once everything is published, go back on the posts in YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram and leave your questions again. We will all do our best to get back to those as soon as possible. So thank you guys.